Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we do the Roman Republic, or political geography and politics in the Roman Republic. The Roman Republic, SPQR, the Senate and the people of Rome. Notice who comes first in this. So, um, we're going to talk about geography, but we're talking political geography when we talk about the Roman Republic. And the reason why is the physical geography doesn't matter all that much. South of the Alps, there are no major physical features that change how and where people live. So, so far we've been talking about physical geography, rivers and mountains and deserts. There's, there's nothing like that in Italy or what will become Italy. And so we talk about the layouts of people, political geography. And so when we look at the political geography of what will become Italy, we have, it's divided into four parts. Famously, um, Julius Caesar writes in his Chronicles of the Gaul, his wars in Gaul, meaning France, um, he, the first sentence, one of the most famous sentences in all of Latin is, all Gaul is divided into three parts. So all Italy is divided into three parts, uh, four parts, excuse me. All of Italy is divided into four parts. The north is settled by the Gauls. The north central by a group of of people called the Etruscans, the center south, the Latins, and the south by the Greeks. So we're going to talk about each of them, and we're going to put a little matrix together. So we talk about the Gauls. Northern Italy is not Italy, actually. The Romans don't think of it as Italy. It's called Cisalpine Gaul, Gaul on this side of the Alps. The Gauls are tough, but dumb. Now, that's unfair to the Gauls, and there are historians who will definitely be like, dude, uh, they're not, and I totally know that. But we have a matrix we're making, and we're trying to be basic here. They're not civilized. They're not like, well, the Greeks or the Etruscans. So they're tough. They're big. They stand somewhere around five foot eight to six feet tall. They're big, they're tough, they fight with giant swords, giant two-handed swords, and they're from across the mountains, trans-alpine Gaul. Trans, across, alpine, the Alps. Trans-alpine Gaul, that Gaul. What is today known as France? Well, somewhere along in history, they came over the mountains and they settled. There's a great story about how a bunch of Gauls were on the other side of the Alps in the French Riviera, and they're drinking wine, and they're like, oh, this is great. Oh, where did this come from? And so one guy goes, oh, it came from over those mountains and someplace over there. And they're like, oh, you know what we should do? We should go and get more. And they're like, yeah, that's great. Who wants to go? And everyone says, let's get wine. And they're like, let's get our weapons because that's what we do we're Gauls and they go over the mountains in the spring they show up on the Italian Riviera and they go whoa, whoa we ain't leaving this is awesome and they basically conquered northern what will become Italy it's not Italy at the time This he, they conquer Cisalpine Gaul and then they tell their friends to come on over and they settle it's a nice story it's apocryphal if it's not true it should be true um, but the point is, is that Northern Gaul is settled by Northern Gaul. Northern Italy is settled by the Gauls who are tough, but dumb and who are related to the people on the other side of the mountains. They're foreigners in Italy. Now, South of them is the Etruscans, E-T-R-U-S-C-A-N-S, E-T-R-U-S-C-A-N-S. And the Etruscans are native Italians. And they come from a place that if you are an Olive Garden fan, you know very well, Tuscany, the land of Chianti. And they are smart, but weak. So the Gauls, tough, but dumb. The Etruscans, smart, but weak. The Romans will claim half of all they know came from the Etruscans. They built cities. They got good government. They are native Italians. 
but they're weak. They're constantly fighting each other. The real reason the goals probably settled in Cisalpine Gaul was because of an Etruscan civil war brought them over as mercenaries. And then they won the war and they look at the people who had hired them and like the Terminator and Skynet and the Matrix and lots of you know, like dystopian tech thrillers. They looked at their paymasters and said, why are we taking orders from you? We're better than you. And then they conquered the northern part of Italy, which was part of the Etruscan territory. So the Etruscans are smart, but weak. South of them is the Latins, L-A-T-I-N-S. Why are they called the Latins? They speak Latin. They are native Italians too, and they are dumb and weak. They are from the poorest part of Italy. They have small villages. They are dumb and weak, and the Romans are Latin. Now, this is important to understand. The Romans are Latin, but not all Latins are Roman. When we start, there's 70 or 100 different villages, towns, small cities that are Latin. And they're all little kingdoms unto themselves. And they spend most of their time doing what everybody does, fighting with each other. There's no unity. Just because they're all Latins and they speak a similar language does not mean there's any unity. There's none. So they're native Italians who are weak and dumb and poor, weak, dumb, and poor. And this is what the Romans are going to spend most of their early days fighting against. The first couple hundred years is just Romans fighting other people like them, other Latins. And you go, well, why? And it's like, well, it makes total sense, right? They don't have an advantage against other Latins. They live the same way. They have the same advantages and the same disadvantages. So wars between them are long, bloody. A lot of them are stalemates because not one side has a natural advantage in their culture, in their politics, in their military. They fight the same way. And so the some of the longest period of fighting is the period of time where Rome tries to conquer the other Latins. And finally in the south... Magna Gracia, which we've already talked about, Napoli and Sicily, the Greeks. The Greeks are foreigners. They come from Greece. They settled on the coasts. They have conquered it, and they are smart and tough. Remember, the Greeks are smart. We talked about drama. We talked about philosophy, right? They're also tough. They won the Persian Wars. Alexander will conquer the Persian Empire. You don't do that if you're weak. So the Gauls are tough but dumb. The Etruscans, smart but weak. The Latins, weak and dumb. The Greeks, ah, oh, the Greeks, smart and tough. So who should conquer the world? Definitely not Rome. They're in the worst position of the four. They should definitely not conquer the world. So then a major question we have is, how do they conquer the world? How are they going to create this empire that goes from the Atlantic to the Euphrates that 25% of humanity will live in? And it will last in some form or another until 1453 AD. How is that possible? Well, it's because... Uh, as dumb as they are as a society, the individuals looked around and went, uh-oh, we got problems. Rome was surrounded by enemies. In fact, from 600 to 509 BC, and in this period, we're talking about the Roman Republic, all, all the numbers are BC, BCE. So they're always counting down to Jesus. They're always counting down to, to one. They're always counting down to, to zero. They're always going backwards. So from 600 to 509, they're owned by an Etruscan king. They're actually so weak, the weak Etruscans actually own them. Like, think about how humiliating that is. For a hundred years, they're bossed around by an Etruscan king. Because they're surrounded by enemies, war is a constant state. It was not a question of, will we go to war? It was, against who? Because 
you were going to go fight. You were going to go fight during the summer because that's the war fighting months. The question was just who? And so all men needed to be able to fight because if you're fighting all the time, you run out of men. If you just rely on mercenaries, they're too expensive. Remember, the Romans are poor. And if you just rely on your nobility, you run out of them. So all men need to be able to fight. The result of this is all people are citizens at birth. Unlike the Greeks, where you had to be in the army to get your rights, the Romans are like, dude, you're going in the army, we'll give you your rights. Done. Drop. Here's your rights. Boom. Now get ready for being in the army. You've got 16 years. Go. So people, the Romans grow up knowing they have rights, but also responsibilities. Civitas Romanus. I am a Roman citizen. Carried a lot of power. It carried responsibility. I will fight for Rome. I will serve Rome. But also, Rome's got my back. I am a Roman citizen. And that is going to be incredibly important. St. Paul's father, the tent maker, was given a choice. I could give you a lot of money for the tents I need for my army by the Roman emperor, or you and all of your descendants can have Roman citizenship. Pick. And who did the, what did the tent maker pick? Oh, he picked Roman citizenship. So St. Paul is unique among the apostles, even though he's technically a disciple, but he's unique, but he's called the, the apostle. So, you know, but he's unique among the early ones because he's a Roman citizen. Not Jesus, not Peter, not Thomas. Paul is a Roman citizen because his father was a Roman citizen. And that carries huge, huge. Like Paul cannot be Paul if he's not a Roman citizen. So you get rights and you have responsibilities from the moment you're born. You always have them from birth until death. You have rights and responsibilities. And the society is divided between the patricians, the rich and the plebeians, your middle classes. Yet, the plebeians are also poor, but the ideal of the plebeian is a small either business owner or a small farmer, a yeoman farmer. So wealthy enough to be independent. So we would call that middle classes. That's the ideal. You have the rich and you have the middle classes, the patricians and the plebeians. And what do both of them do? They both join the army. They both serve the state. These are values in the Roman Republic. Everybody, rich and poor, rich and middle, serve. This is not rich man war, poor man fight, which is uh, the American motto since the revolution. Since the American Revolution, there has always been, this is a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. It was said then, it was said in 1812, it was said in the Mexican War, it was said in the Civil War, it's definitely said in World War one, rich man's war, poor man's fight. It's definitely said in Vietnam. The only one where it might not be said was World War II. But there was plenty of people in the 30s saying, oh, that Roosevelt, he wants to get us into a war. So Pearl Harbor kind of changed that. But otherwise, the idea is all people serve the state. And this is a value. This, is, this makes boys into men. You served the state, not yourself. And so you get two major values that come out of this. Authoritas and dignitas. Octoritas is authority. We get authority from it. It is the ability to lead other men. Not just lead them, like command them. That's not, what, that's not octoritas. It's the ability to get other people to follow you. It's legitimacy. It's leadership. It's charisma. Octoritas. That H is probably not supposed to be there in the in the video, but sorry. And dignitas is dignity. But it's more than just like we think about dignity. It's independence. It's manliness. It's femininity. It's feminism. It is the ability to say, I am a Roman citizen. Dignitas is... 
the ability to be a full and independent person who both contributes to the state and is a part of it. These two values are going to be incredibly important in why people do what they do over our next few lectures. The patricians are all about actoritas, authority. Now remember, that's not command. That's not the ability to tell people what to do. It's the ability to get other people to follow you, to lead them. So it's by command, but it's also by charisma, getting people to like you. It's by personality. It's by logic, laying out a good argument that you are a leader of other people because of who you are, not just your position. Your position, your position is part of it. You're a patrician. You're rich. People should follow you. But there's plenty of patricians who are decadent, who are losers, who are weak, who are dumb, who are not charismatic. And actoritas is the ability. It's like it's in some ways being an influencer on Instagram today. It's the ability to get other people to follow you. And that gives you legitimacy. So actoritas and legitimacy have connections to each other. You can't have legitimacy in the Roman world without actoritas, authority. And remember, dignity, dignitas, the ability to think of oneself as a fully-fledged individual, independent individual in the Roman world. All right. So, what about women? Women are citizens, too. This is our first society where women are citizens. They get rights and protections. They are not children. And you go, whoa, 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 professor. What do you mean they're not children? Every other society we have talked about, they're children. I know they're not property. We got that. So they're children. But every other society is their children. Why are they not? Why are the Romans not? Well, go back up to number one, up to the top. Rome is surrounded by enemies, so war is a constant state. So where are the men? The men are constantly away at war, constantly, every summer. For a few months, like in the, in the Egyptian world, remember, for a few months they go away to go farming? Well, in Rome they go away to do fighting, not farming, pyramid building. In Egypt, for a few months... Every year in Old Kingdom Egypt, they go away for a few months to do pyramid building, and then they come back. Well, in Rome, it's you go away and you do war. So women need to have rights because their husbands are away. So if their husband runs a business, what does their wife have to be able to do? She has to be able to run the business while he's away, run the business and if he dies in battle, inherit the business, leave the business to a son and or daughter to run when she dies, sue people who don't pay their bills, right? So she needs legal standing. And the only people who have all of those things are citizens. So women get an education in the Roman world. They're, of course, going to have the marriage veto. That goes with kind of without saying, because even the even women as children get a marriage veto. Right. But they're going to get that as well. They're going to keep their family name. So unlike modern Americans, where you where you you give up your name, Jane Smith becomes uh, Jane Miller. Well, what happened to Jane Smith? She's gone. Legally, she has given up all connection to her. Smith, the Smith family. Not in the Roman world. In the Roman world, you keep that. And it shows who you're connected to. You keep your family name. You keep... So who your mother is matters. Because your mother is a connection to your mother's family. You gain... Women gain inheritance. They gain business ownership and legal protections. We even see how important they are in religious ceremonies. Are the most famous are the Vestals, but there's women priests because they are female gods. 
But the Vestals are, are the most famous are the Vestal virgins, women who give up their youth and their, their baby making and sexuality to their, their religion, to the female gods. And you do not mess with them. They are powerful. They have religious importance. And so women matter in the society. They are citizens. They, are, they don't go to war, but they are citizens. How they feel about things matters in the Roman world. Which is why, interestingly, even today, Italian society has a very matriarchal part to it. The, the men might run the government, the men might run the outside, the public sphere, as we say. But woe be the person who tries to tell an Italian woman how to run her household. I have yet to meet the Italian man who tries to do that and gets away with it. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. They may leave the house and go do things. They'll go hang out at the, the soccer club, or they'll go to the pub, or, you know, they'll hang out with the boys, but come home and criticize Mama's sauce? Uh-uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Nope. My maleness has gotten me thrown out of enough Italian female kitchens. It's go find something to do or go do this. Yes. Okay. That's, that's my role. I'm a doer. I do not. Nope. Get out. Out. So. So women are citizens in Roman society. And because of that, they have rights and protections and education and marriage and business and legal protections. They can sue. They can run the home. They can run the estate. They can run the business while their husbands are away. They are a proxy. And so they need an education for all those things. They need to be able to, to actually run the business, run the farm, hire workers, pay people buy supplies, have credit, take out credit while their husband is away. So what kind of politics are we talking? Well, the result of all of this war is that Rome needs people. It needs people to fight. You will run out of people because every battle you fight, some of your people are going to be dead. And so you have to expand who, can, who is a citizen. And Roman citizens want to have a say. If they're going to go out and fight, they want to say who they're going out to fight. And remember, patricians fight too. This is going to be a big part when we do the Roman legion. So citizens want to have a say. If, if the, the government is like, hey, we're going to go fight Gauls, people want to be like, whoa. Oh, wait a minute. They're far away. They're really tough. They're not threatening us at the moment. I don't think right now is a good time to go do that. They want to have a say. And so the government you get is the Republic of Rome. This is not Plato's Republic. This is the Republic. The Republic that America will more or less create, right? We both have a Senate. It is the Republic of Rome. And for the next 500 years... This will be the government that will conquer the world. So, what does it have? Well, first it has the Senate, which is literally means old wealthy men. It is a group of old wealthy men. It's a council. It's not a council, which is the leader of the Senate, the elected leader of the Senate, but it's a council, a group. And it's old wealthy men. It's about, I think through most of its time, it's 200 people. Or so, and they represent the biggest families, the richest families in Rome. And they make the decisions. They run the country as a group. As a group, they elect a leader to like be a general for a year. Every year, you can't be 
elected twice in a row, except in extraordinary circumstances. And what the Senate does is is make the decisions. They run the country as a group. And so the way they run it is consensus, agreement. Why? Why don't they vote on stuff? And the reason why is they all know each other. They're all related. And this is the way our Senate was supposed to work, is supposed to work, is written to work. The idea is everybody knows each other, so we can hammer out agreements. So the majority never abuses the minority, and the minority never stops the majority from getting what it wants. They work together. So the majority says, hey, we really want X. And the minority group says, I don't really know if that's a good idea. But the majority says, we're the majority. And then they negotiate it. And it's like, all right, you can get what you want, but we don't want it to be paid for by more taxes on the rich. And the Senate will say, okay, we'll figure that out. And they'll come to an agreement. So the Senate is run by consensus and negotiation, right? That's the way the U.S. Senate suppo- is supposed to work. Remember, when we started, there are 13 or so states. The Senate is picked. It's not elected. It's picked by the states. So who are these 26 to 30 guys? Because there's a couple new states who came in, in, the, in the, during the um, Articles of Confederation period. So who are these guys? They're all ex-revolutionaries. They all knew each other. They're wealthy guys in their state who had been imported during the American Revolution. There's no new people. They all know each other. Some of them are related to each other. And so they figure, hey, we don't need to vote on things. We don't need a 50 plus one. We don't need a 51, uh, you know, a 50.1%. To, to decide things, we'll negotiate. We'll get along. It'll be, it's, it'll be the Roman Republic. We all know each other. Well, you could see how that works now. But the idea was they all had a reason to compromise because they all knew each other. Politics did not stop when the Senate went home for the day because all these guys were related. They all knew each other. They all lived in Rome. So that's the that's the patricians. The patricians had the Senate and they're running the system. So where do the plebeians come in? Remember, Roman citizens want to have a say. Where do the plebeians come in? That's the tribunes. The tribunes are representatives and they are the elected representatives of the people. They divided kind of like we do with Congress. They divided the city up into pieces into I think it's 11 pieces. And each of those 11 pieces would send a representative to the Senate. And they worked essentially like polling. They didn't really have a lot of power in the Senate. Remember, it's the Senate and people of Rome. The Senate ran the show. But the Senate doesn't want to do anything that's going to anger the people. So basically, they would make, when they wanted to propose new legislation, they go to the tribunes and go, Tribunes, this is what we want to do. This is what we're going to do. But why don't you tell us what the people think about this? And the tribunes would say, okay, we'll see you tomorrow. And the tribunes would go home, go call a meeting, bring together a hundred or a couple hundred people, like a town hall, say, tomorrow the Senate will vote on this. They're going to vote on making rich people's taxes zero and poor people's taxes uh, 70%. Of what they make. And there's essentially one of four responses. There's, we love it. Woohoo! Woohoo! Do it! Well, and they'll go back to the Senate and say, the people love it, and it'll pass. They'll be the, well, I don't know, but the Senate knows what it's doing, and I trust the patrician, so I guess it's okay. It sounds okay. In which case, there might be a few tweaks, but it's likely to pass. Then there's the, well, it doesn't sound so good to me. I don't know. I mean, it's not terrible, but I don't really like it all that much. Which will result in the Senate either making lots of tweaks to it to get it passed, 
or um, tabling it. You know, be like, oh, we can't make enough tweaks to make it happy to the people, so we just won't do it. And then there's the final one, which is, if you do this, this makes me so mad, I'm going to burn down this wooden city. I'm going to burn it down. In which case, the Senate, when the tribunes come in the next day, the Senate will say, oh, we are the Senate of Rome. Tribunes, tell us what the people think of our newest law about our... Rich people having zero taxes and poor people having lots of taxes. And if they say they're going to burn down the city if you do this, the Senate will say, well, the Senate can do whatever it wants. But let's vote to see if we table this and we'll talk about it another time, in which case we will never talk about it. Let's send it to committee to be discussed. And so what the tribunes represent is not It's a poll. It's a way for the Senate to run the show and keep autoritas, keep authority. It's running the show, but it's making that nod that the people have to like what's going on. If they don't support it, bad things happen. And there's a couple ways bad things happen. One, the the citizens might not show up for a war. There are literal cases, and we're going to talk about one in a second with the 12 tables, where the Senate voted for a war and the people didn't show up. Well, what what do you do then? There's not enough enough senators to fight a war. And they're old at that. So, uh, um, uh uh-oh. So you need to have popular um, acquiescence. The people have to support what's going on. So that's how the tribunes work. Now, you'll, you'll read about a tribune veto. That's basically saying, if you do this, the people are going to burn the city down, which is the second thing people could do. Remember, you're a senator, you live in Rome, especially in the early days of the Republic. For the first few hundred years, o- almost all the senators are going to live in Rome. They might have a, they might have a, a place outside of Rome for the summer, you know, a getaway place. But especially in the early days of the Republic, they all lived in Rome. You had to walk to the Senate. And so the, the Rome was made of wood. And everything, because it's a Republic, is, vote, is, is open to the people. People don't vote on it because they have representatives. But you had to publish it. You had to tell the people what the Senate was doing every day. This is part of the Tribune's job, but it's also they would publish it. So if you spent your day voting on stuff that the plebeians were going to hate, you spent your day hurting the plebeians, you then had to walk home through the plebeian neighborhoods to get to your big, fat, rich person's house, which wasn't big and fat. It was bigger than regular people's houses. But we are not yet. Remember, Rome is still poor. So you're going back to your nice, you know, McMansion type of house. It's not, it's not super huge, but it's pretty big for a Roman. What happens next? The people read what you just did. They see you voted for it because all of this has to be published. The Tribune tells the people what just happened and what it means for them. And so around 3 a.m., you wake up smelling something's cooking a nice campfire or something hmm oh wait it's your house on fire and you run out of the you run out of your house in your night clothes with your wife and your kids and there's a bunch of guys with bats or the equivalent of bats who are working men so they have they're ripped, right? These are guys who do like longshoremen. They're blacksmiths. And they say, looks like you got a fire there, Senator. Oh, yeah, my my house is on fire. Oh, I'm going to lose all my possessions. Well, looks like we uh, could put the fire out for you. We have all this water just sitting here. Let's see how you voted today in the Senate. Ah, uh, shirt. Yeah, looks like you... Uh, voted against us several times. 
So, uh, yeah. That house is going to burn. And uh, we're going to send a message. So what's going to happen next? You're going to take a whooping. You're not going to be killed. The plebeians cannot kill the patricians. That breaks all kinds of rules. But we're talking about tough Romans here. And you can take a whooping. A Roman man is going to take a whooping sooner or later. Even even patricians. Because remember, they all serve in the army. And you took you. Hey, you play with fire. You expect to get burned sooner or later. And you, when that time happens, you got to take your whooping. And so they're going to beat the snot out of you. While your wife and your kids may look on, may not. You take your whooping. And you show up the next day. No bruises on your face, so nobody needs to know. And you show up and you go, uh, I want to vote to... Um, I think we want to reconsider what we passed yesterday. And there's probably going to be a bunch of other senators like, yeah, let's reconsider. Uh, definitely want to reconsider. Yeah, um, you know, I was having a, a nice dinner and the fire just got out of control. You know, these 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 cooks today, they don't know how to use proper uh, fire and ventilation. And uh, my house just burned down. So um, I'm going to have to rebuild the house. Uh, luckily, no one was hurt. But uh, we got to work on this. So, um, but while we're here, let's let's reconsider what we passed yesterday. And so the, you remember that there's fear in the system, just like there is in the Greek system. There's always fear. And that's important. The fear makes the system work. The patricians know they are a minority. And they know they need the plebeians for the system to work. And they also live with the plebeians. They live with the poor. And so they need the poor not to commit violence against them. They know every day they are outnumbered. They can't hide away in a limo and go out to the Virginia suburbs. They have to walk through the hood. They have to walk through the neighborhood to get home. And so there's a connection. And that's going to break later on. That connection is going to break. And these senators are going to build giant palaces out in the suburbs. And they're not going to deal with plebeians very much anymore. And that's going to be one of the reasons for the collapse of the Roman Republic. All right, so we have the Senate. We have the tribunes. So we have the patricians. We have the plebeians. What's the rules? How are these people going to get along? That's the 12 tables. The 12 tables is a written constitution. It is the rules for society and its innovation is it will treat everyone equally. These rules will apply to everyone equally. Remember the story I told where the Senate had a war? This is, this is what happened. The Senate had a war. They voted for a war. I'm going to say it's the goals. Maybe it's not. I think it's the goals, but it doesn't really matter because what happens next is important. So they call out the army. And the army assembles. All the plebeians come out. And they go, all right, men, we are marching to the north to go fight the Gauls. And the men sat down on the field, on the field of Mars. The men in their, in their serried lines, armed with their swords and their shields, sat down. They had a sit-down strike. And the patricians pooped their pants. But, but, but we're at war. We, se we declared war on the Gauls. They're coming. They're expecting to fight us. Uh, no. They're expecting to fight you. I didn't vote to go to war against the Gauls. I had no say in it. You voted. But, but they're coming to take our stuff. No, 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 no. They're coming to take your stuff. You're the rich guys. Uh, uh, but what what do you want? We want to have a say. And we want the rules to treat us equally. But, but we're not equal. I'm rich. I'm better than you. Well, 
right now, you're dead. You can go up and fight the goals, all uh, 200 of you, and die. Or you can treat everybody equally in front of the law. Pick one. <sighs> How about everyone gets a free goldfish every year? Nope. Everyone gets treated equally. We want the rules to apply to us the same way they apply to you. Now, that's an important part. They don't lower the, the, the way the law treats the patricians to the plebeian level. No, 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 no. They elevate the plebeians to the patrician level. And the idea is that everybody will be treated the same. All citizens, men, women, rich, poor, will all be... And again, civitas romanus. I am a Roman citizen. I am equal to all of you, mother... All. I take a backseat to nobody. Notice dignitas. I will not go to the law court and be treated second class. And so the 12 tables are the original constitution. They'll be changed here and there. They're written in stone. Remember, they're written in stone. They're tables, literally tables, so that they don't change. So you just can't cross it out and be like, well, you know, no, these are the 12 tables. They are written in stone. They do not change. And they will treat everyone in Roman society equally. You're all equal before the law. And that, that is what the what makes Rome, Rome. This is totally new. Nobody really does this. Even in the democracies. You had to be a Athenian citizen. But it was hard to be an Athenian citizen. And it's even harder to be a Spartan citizen. The Spartans didn't want to give citizenship to anybody. The Athenians kept making it harder and harder and harder to be an Athenian citizen because they didn't want to share power. The Romans, on the other hand, are willing to share citizenship and the, and the responsibilities of citizenship. Remember, there's always the two sides. Rights and responsibilities go together. And this is the most important part of the Roman Republic is natio, N-A-T-I-O. Natio. The idea that anybody, anyone, 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 anyone can become a Roman citizen. Anyone can become a Roman citizen. If you do two things, you fight for Rome and you act Roman. Does that sound familiar? It should, because that's us. That's the United States. Anyone can become an American citizen. Anyone. Now we've added to that, but if the quickest way to become an American citizen, fight for the United States. There is a large percentage of green card holders in our military. I knew a few in, in grad school. I lived with a few. One guy was in the Navy. He was Jamaican. He had just, he had enter, exited the Navy a year before. He was online to get his citizenship and then once he got his citizenship, his wife, would, who was Haitian, would get her citizenship, and their kids would be American citizens. The idea was Rome was fighting all the time. And so what it was willing to do, and this is so innovative, nobody else in the ancient world did it. The Assyrians don't do it. The Persians don't do it. The Spartans and the Athenians don't do it. This is why the Romans won. They were willing to share Roman citizenship with everybody if you fought for Rome. They needed men. They needed new men. So when they conquered another Latin town, they turned to the Latins and said, you're a Roman citizen now if you fight for Rome and you act Roman. And they said, okay. In fact, there will come a time when the Romans will try to stop this. Because they're conquered so many people, they're worried that if they gave people Roman citizenship, they'd stop being Roman. They would become these other things. There were too many foreigners. And the foreigners actually had a war against Rome 
to force Rome to make them Roman citizens. Think about that. Nowhere else is there a war like this, where the people fighting against the government are demanding that the government recognize them as citizens. Usually it's, I want to be independent of the government, right? The civil war. We don't want to be part of this government anymore. We want to be independent. No, no. It's like Texas invading the United States in order to become part of the United States in 1835. Or 1845. Right? That's that's the equivalent. Texas want... The people in Texas want to be Americans and want Texas to be an a, a American state and say, make us an American state. And the government says no. And so they invade Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas in order to force the U.S. government to make them American citizens. That's how crazy this idea is. But that's how important Nashio was. Nashio is what makes the Romans the Romans. The 12 tables where everyone's considered equal and Nashio, where anyone can become a Roman citizen. St. Paul will be a Roman citizen. The Spaniards, the Gauls, the Etruscans, Greeks will all become Roman citizens. And that, that, that is the most important killer app for Roman success because the Romans will always, 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 always be able to tap into more men to fill the military. Up until the end of the Roman Empire, they will always be able to access more Roman citizens by simply going, poof, you're a Roman citizen, fight for Rome. And people wanted to do it. It's only at the end of the Roman Empire, a thousand years from now, that that inexhaustible level of, of commitment will be so battered down that the Rome, that the emperors, and the emperors so terrible that they couldn't tap into it anymore. That people simply didn't care. It is this, Natio, N-A-T-I-O, that makes Rome, Rome. Without it, Rome isn't Rome. Rome is a dinky little Latin town that gets swallowed up by the Etruscans, the Gauls, or the Greeks. It's, we don't talk about Rome without Natio because it doesn't become Rome. Just like the United States. We do not have 300 million people in the United States without Natio. Because we make them into Americans. There are 4 million people living in Ireland who are Irish. There are 30 million Irish Americans. Seven times the amount in America. For a long period of the 20th century, there were more Jews living in America than there were Jews in Israel. There were more Jews in New York than in Israel. So, and they were all Americans. They're Americans. They're Jews and American at the same time. There's no dual loyalty or they are Americans. Irish Americans are Americans. African Americans are Americans. People are like, oh, that hashtag. Well, that hashtag matters because the American part is part of it. It is I became an American. Nobody else in the ancient world does this. And nobody else really does it now, to be honest. And we're starting to pull away from that. And this has been the thing that made us us. In our next uh, lesson, we're going to do the Roman Legion and Roman society during the Republic. The Roman, what the Roman Legion, how it fought, but also what it said about Roman society during the Republic. So be careful out there. Hope you enjoyed. See you soon.